coming up tonight, stories from the classroom. We talk to teachers, students, and the folks who are working behind the scenes to make education possible during the pandemic. VCU Insight starts right now. From the Richard T. Robertson School of Media and Culture at Virginia Commonwealth University, named best student newscast in the Mid-Atlantic, this is VCU Insight. Good evening and welcome to VCU Insight. I'm Dominga Murray, thanks for joining us. Tonight, we're bringing you stories from the new classroom. Virtual learning, homeschool, Zoom, lectures, and learning pods, COVID has impacted classrooms across the Commonwealth. We're no exception. Insight is a production of the Robertson School of Media and Culture here at VCU. Our team has changed how we report, how we use equipment, and as you can see, how we record our newscasts. Tonight we begin with Richmond Public Schools where we met one staff member who volunteered to keep working so that her students wouldn't go hungry. Here's Lucy Stumpo. Students may not be in the cafeteria this fall, but Barbara Anderson is. They gave us the option of staying and working or going out and staying at home. And since this is my building and I love the kids that I feed, I decided to stay here and work. Anderson is an Armstrong High School staff member who has spent the past few months bagging food for those in need. RPS's food distribution program has grown from the 52 mobile sites it started with over the summer to 1,095 sites. The program has given out more than 1.5 million meals. Over the fall semester, Anderson will not only be packing food for kids, but distributing it to different areas around Richmond. This is one of the food distribution stops here in the East End. An RPS bus driver delivers food here every school day at 7 a.m. Students receive one breakfast and one lunch every Monday through Thursday and two breakfasts and two lunches every Friday. Shaday Harris is the Chief Engagement Officer of the Food Distribution Program. She helped advocate for a waiver to expand the program beyond Richmond Public School children and to feed anyone under the age of 18. Since the waiver was approved, the program can continue to feed any hungry students in the area. We were really concerned that if we didn't get that approval, we would really be like doing a disservice to so many students who we, we, we were feeding since March. Previously, students needed to give their school number to receive food at drop-off locations. With VCU Insight, I'm Lucy Stumpo. Recent data shows that one of every five children in Richmond experiences food insecurity. Other Richmond Public School employees are working to make sure students don't go without books this semester. Insight's Oliver Mendoza checked out their learning delivery service. For students around Richmond, the Lit Limo is here. That's lit as in literature. Today, Judith Dykeman is at the wheel of the Lit Limo, a school bus with seats taken out to fill with boxes of books. So we have from, all the way from board books for toddlers up to young adult books for high school. The Lit Limo has been operating since the beginning of July around Richmond, four days a week. Dykeman says once they learned they were going virtual, they decided to add a fifth day. So we do go rain and shine because there are some people, I mean, they expect us, so if they have an umbrella, they come out. The Lit Limo stops at each location and opens its doors for students and parents to step inside and search through crates full of books. I'm here outside Blackwell Elementary School with a lit limo who's made the first of its five stops for the day. Monica McLean has been a librarian at Blackwell Elementary School for five years now. The librarians love the idea of putting books in children's hands under any circumstance. According to the Virginia Department of Education, Blackwell Elementary School is at the high poverty level on the state's school quality profile. So I'm thankful they have it because before, it was primarily the responsibility of individual school librarians to try to pull resources and get donations. By having the Lit Limo, it's consistent. They're there every day, Monday through Friday. And so, you know, the kids know about it and they're coming out. Reporting for VCU Insight, Oliver Mendoza. With most of the Commonwealth school districts fully virtual for the fall semester, many of the state's nearly 90,000 public school teachers have had a big adjustment to make. But for first-time teachers, perhaps an even greater challenge. Insight's Katie Mooney caught up with two recent college grads to learn how the students become teachers in the midst of the pandemic. It's hard because everybody's a new teacher right now. 
When Taylor Martin graduated from Lynchburg University, she didn't imagine her first time on the other side of the desk would be like this. In her first weeks as a virtual fourth grade teacher, Martin says she's already run into plenty of challenges. From technical difficulties, to constant changes in the school system, to coordinating with parents who are often working from home. Parents have to be hands on. There's no way that a kindergartner is gonna be able to log on and figure it out, all of that. Martin says this school year is going to require all hands on deck. If the parents don't help them, then they don't have Wi-Fi, and they don't motivate them, then how am I supposed to, how are they supposed to do things? Other new graduates are taking a different approach to their first year of teaching. I don't know if I want to apply, like, I don't know if I want my first year to be in this, like, in this pandemic. Kaylee Rosengarten graduated last December with her master's in teaching, with hopes of starting her career this fall. Because of COVID, she found a different opportunity. They're called learning pods, where small groups of students learn outside the classroom, but still in person, often with hired help. And many parents are using this teaching alternative rather than taking on the challenge themselves. For Rosengarten, this means supervising seven kids from three families in one house five days a week as a full-time support teacher. So if there was an assistant teacher in a classroom, that's who what I am. Despite the challenge of building their planes as they fly it, these new educators are paving the way for the sake of their students. And I did not want that to scare me away from teaching, but I still wanted to like help. Reporting from Richmond, I'm Katie Mooney. Out of the 132 school divisions in Virginia, only 10 of them are meeting in person every day. 68 school divisions are all virtual. Those who teach our youngest learners are having to get creative. I talked to a first grade teacher and a first grader about their experience so far. Heather Zediak is meeting her first graders virtually due to COVID-19. This year, I think teachers need to remember to be patient and flexible with their students because we're all learning, it's new, it's different than anything we've ever done before. Manassas is one of the 68 Virginia school districts that has gone fully virtual. Zediak says she has the option of teaching from her empty classroom, an option that might make students feel closer to being there in person. This year it's gonna be really difficult teaching our kids about social emotional learning because a lot of that interaction is face to face. So virtually it's hard to teach children to process their feelings and teach them social skills. So I think that's definitely gonna be a challenge this year. First grader Madison Atkinson stresses the importance of breaks throughout the day. Students start their morning on a video chat platform called Zoom at 7.30 and end their day at 3.30, Monday through Friday. Sometimes I can't concentrate, but a break helps me. ZDX says teachers are making an effort not to spend too long on a given activity to work alongside children's attention spans, help with distractibility, and keep students engaged. It's also important to remain hopeful and remember that we're still going to have a good year and we're going to make the best of it, even though it's going to look different. An August poll from Gallup showed that 10% of parents are homeschooling. That's doubled from last year. As Insights Orzo Heidi Gerben reports, it's a path some parents never expected to take. But this year, with the circumstances, I knew I had to do something different. Jamie House didn't think she'd become a teacher this year. I've always kind of had it in my heart to homeschool, but I was a little too terrified to do it. Like many other parents, House was uncomfortable with the idea of homeschooling her children with little to no experience, but she found a group that helped her ease into it. Um, we are doing Classical Conversations, which is a homeschool co-op where you go once a week and share the rest of the week um, on your own. Homeschool co-ops consist of groups of families working together both virtually and sometimes in person. There are all kinds of co-ops. They range from enrichment to sports to uh, academic co-ops. There's very different kinds of co-ops and we participate in enrichment and those means those are co-ops that are designed to support kids extracurricular activities. In the Richmond School District, just about 200 students in grades K through 5 were homeschooled last year. Now, we don't have this year's numbers yet, but nationwide, those numbers are going up.
You may qualify to go the homeschool route if you have a high school diploma, a Virginia teaching license, or can otherwise prove that you are able to provide your child an adequate education. To the mom who is struggling in COVID schooling or making a maiden voyage into homeschooling or investigating options, we, education is a lifelong learning process, um, you, but you are not alone. For VCU Insight, I'm Orzo Hajigurban. Even though COVID-19 has had a significant impact on every level of education, education advocates are warning that the biggest impact has been on low-income families. Here's Insight's Lauren Bray. Many students are away from playgrounds and classrooms and are now learning online. Education specialist and Henrico resident Farika Elliott has been working with students and teachers to ensure success during this pandemic. Though it's an adjustment for everyone, she says students without accessible technology and resources are facing an even tougher situation. Um, I feel sad that our lower income students as well as all of our students aren't able to participate in face-to-face -face school because of COVID. Um, I know that missing out on time with friends and teachers is a big deal. It affects social emotional growth. According to John Hopkins Medicine, the COVID-19 pandemic, the hardest hit individuals are children from low income households due to less than adequate resources needed for education, nutrition and social development. Thankfully in our district, um, we've been able to support um, lower income families with um, hot spots, um, free meals, lunch, breakfast, etc. For teachers used to seeing their students in the classroom every day, seeing them only online has been an adjustment. I feel for my babies like I, as an educator, I want what's best for them. And I know what's best for them is coming to school and being around their friends and like getting that hands-on learning. Mercedes Jeter is a second grade teacher who is now hosting her classes all online. She says the transition has been difficult, but they are doing their best. And the parents are stressed, so it's kind of like, we're all in this together and we're trying to work as a team to get done what needs to be done. Um, and I think we just need to have grace and be patient. Reporting for VCU Insight, I'm Lauren Bray. Henrico County Public Schools have also gone all virtual for the fall. Timothy Cantrell talked with two teachers who are making it work. So it's kind of like the first year of school all over again. Like many other teachers, Abby Sirier is ready for the new semester online. She says online learning can be a tricky problem to solve when your subject is math. It's trying to find different um, technology solutions where I can actually like see their work um, instead of just like, here's the answer, he's right, and he's wrong. Lacey Hodges is also having to adapt her teaching style. She works with students with disabilities, and she says technology can be a big problem for them. A lot of us are addicted to our phones and technology, but for some students with disabilities, when they fixate on something, it's hard to stop. Even though the students won't be here at J.R. Tucker High School, Syria and Hodges will be. They're turning their empty classrooms into virtual learning spaces. I'm very lucky that our county is letting us go into our uh, classrooms. So I, I will be doing most of my teaching from school. Hodges is hopeful that her students will be able to join her again soon. They keep kind of hinting or tiptoeing around the subject that one of the first people that they would have returned to school would be our students in self-contained classes. Though there have been talks with higher up positions, a return to school for students with disabilities is still uncertain. Reporting for VCU, I'm Timothy Cantrell. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll take a look at how the pandemic has changed college life. From the folks trying to keep classrooms clean to students being held in isolation at VCU to senior athletes hoping they get to see a final season. We'll take a look at COVID on campus. We've never been very good at sitting still. Maybe that's why we built our campus in the middle of a city. Why we put our classrooms on riverbanks, in Fortune 500 companies, even on stage. At Virginia Commonwealth University, learning happens everywhere. What matters most is how you make it real. Only about a third of VCU's fall classes are being taught in person, but when a classroom is used, it needs to be cleaned. 
Insights Ben Malakoff met with the team doing the work. March 2020. The students had gone. The classrooms were empty. Campus abandoned. Except for people like Billy Baker and Ed Harlow. They've cleaned VCU's campus for five and 12 years respectively. It's more challenging, um, a lot more stressful, a lot more work. It have changed. Our workload has gotten heavier. Custodians now clean every building twice a day, including all the touch points, which is any surface someone touches, like a doorknob or an elevator button. We actually brought some of our teams from the night shift, and we waived some of the heavy floor cleaning that goes on at night in order to bring the teams on today. Just think about all the surfaces that need to be cleaned. For students to get into the classroom, they need to touch the doorknob. Once you're inside, it's the desks and the computers that get the most contact. From pulling out your chair to typing on the lab computers. Every surface students touch needs to be cleaned. While keeping the school clean, Billy Baker, Ed Harlow, and all other custodians still have another job keeping themselves and their families safe. I wake up in the morning, say a prayer, kiss my wife goodbye, get to work, wash my hands, sanitize, get to it. Because we're not just looking out for everybody else, we're looking out for each other also. But I tell my people, job, we got a job we got to do, we just do it. In Richmond, Virginia, Ben Malikoff, VCU Insight. Incoming VCU freshmen are in for a not-so-traditional introduction to their college careers. Insight's Tim Corley reports on the new, mostly virtual, freshman experience. This is what a college lecture hall looks like in the fall of 2020 at VCU. VCU freshman Kyle Herbert lives in Gladding Residence Center 3. When applying to college, he had no idea his dorm room would become his classroom. Um, some of my expectations is that uh, I was going to be physically going to class. I wasn't expecting to be isolated pretty much all the time. Social gatherings are a major aspect of the college experience, and due to the current COVID-19 regulations, Herbert believes he's missing out. Like, the first day I was here, I only got to know a handful of people, um, but I feel like if this wasn't, you know, during a pandemic, I would have met a lot more people, I would have become a lot more socially interactive with other people around the campus. Around this time of the year, lecture halls like these would usually be filled to capacity with freshmen. But now, this lecture has been moved online. Despite the move toward virtual, students are still enrolling. According to the VCU Board of Visitors electronic meeting, the latest numbers have only shown a 3% drop in fall enrollment from 2018 to 2019. Senior chemical engineering and physics major Alex Jorgensen believes it'll be difficult for freshmen to get the most out of their education due to the move to online classes. I definitely think overall the, I guess, yeah, the quality of education because there's, not, there's only so much you can do over Zoom. VCU is working to keep COVID numbers down to avoid shutting down like James Madison University and University of North Carolina. With VCU Insight, I'm Tim Corley. James Madison University has since announced that it will resume on-campus classes, but as Insight's Sam Hooper reports on campuses across the Commonwealth, virtual learning is still very much a part of the curriculum. Max Rudolph's first semester of his senior year looks a little different than he imagined. When you're in a classroom, like listening to a lecture, it's a lot easier to like just be interested and like be be engaged and like taking notes and stuff like that. Rudolph isn't alone in preferring in-person classes. A recent survey from Public Viewpoint found that over half of college students think that the education provided this fall will be less valuable than last fall. I prefer in-person classes just because I feel like like school costs a lot of money and like you get more for, your, for your, what you're paying for, I guess, when you're in person. According to Virginia Commonwealth University's website, the university will have a mixture of in-person, hybrid, and online classes for the fall 2020 semester. Classes with 50 students and up have to be online. For undergraduate classes, that means 42% are online, 35% are in person, and the rest are blended or hybrid. But a big difference from the spring semester, professors have had more time to go from here to here. Big on engaging with students, and that's just 
somewhere between harder and impossible online. So it just, it just gets in the way of my approach. Cortina says he's actually developed new online components of his classes that he likes enough to keep in place whenever classes go back to in-person. One example would be Cortina pre-recording his lectures and having his students watch them prior to coming to class. I can assign the recordings and then I'll be more comfortable using class time for discussion rather than me just repeating what they should already have heard in the recordings. Reporting for VCU Insight, I'm Sam Hooper. But even with all the virtual classes and increased cleaning, there have been COVID cases on VCU's campus. Insight's Cameron Branscombe reports on what happens when a residential student tests positive. After testing positive for coronavirus, VCU senior Armand Harrell experienced painful coughing spills and a temperature that reached 100.4 degrees. It started transitioning out of like congestion and sneezing into more of a um, cough. Like a, like a solid type of cough. Harold said he felt ill, got tested, and within hours of positive results, VCU put him in isolation. I had a phone call scheduled for 2 o'clock. After that, I moved directly to a virtual appointment um, with a doctor. They scheduled a time for me to come in to get tested. And I ended up going to get tested at like 3.30ish that day. And then I came back to my dorm and they were ready to come pick me up at five. I think they've done pretty an effective job to the extent of like the isolation. Like when you get tested, it happens quick. Like you're in isolation immediately. They put you in isolation before you even get your test results back. Harold told me that VCU has provided him with everything he's needed from meal drop offs every day to thermometers to take his temperature every day. Like my knees while I've been in quarantine and isolation, I've been taken care of. So. Harold was quarantined on the 24th of August and was released on the 11th of September. He says he kept his spirits high while being in isolation and has found ways to entertain himself. Also, I'm a pretty positive dude. I try to stay positive about everything. The isolation building is located here in Glass Residence 3. VCU has implemented strict rules for those in isolation. For example, once you have entered isolation, your VCU ID will not be able to open any doors. If you are caught sneaking out, you risk being suspended and losing your housing with no refund. It can spread so easily. Like, just be cautious about the people, not only the people that you are around, but also the people who the people you're around are around, because that's really how it jumps from place to place. So just be cautious. For VCU Insight, I'm Cameron Branson. Of course, campus life isn't all about classes. Clubs and organizations have been hit with a challenge this semester as well. Here's Insight's Jasmine Speller. The VCU telegram looks the same. Events, meetings, get-togethers, but one big change, they're mostly online. The shift to virtual isn't just class, it's also a lot of campus life. Student organizations and clubs are limited to 10-person meetings. David Green is the director of the University Student Commons and Activities. He says the Commons is providing portable Zoom stations to help connect students. So what we would do is say, we can offer you two rooms and then give them two rooms that may not even be side by side, but it would be two rooms. And then we would zoom from one room into the other. VCU student Sterling Murray is a part of a living learning community, but she is doing her second year of the program at home. At first I was like, okay, I'm just gonna like live at home because it's gonna be a lot cheaper. But now that I'm actually here, I'm like, oh, I kind of miss like being on campus and stuff. TJ Boyce is the treasurer of the National Society of Collegiate Scholars and the president of the Urban Studies Student Association. He now has to figure out how to recruit incoming students online. From what we've been seeing recently, actually more people participate because it's from the comforts of their own home and they don't have to, I guess, travel out. VCU has 432 student organizations and usually they meet here in the University Student Commons. But recently they have to find more creative ways to get connected. A quick look at the Division of Student Affairs website. You'll find everything from Netflix parties, TikTok challenges to Zoom meetings. What COVID is going to allow some of these students to do is to realize that they can be and should be active parts of our community no matter where they decide to learn from.
our final story tonight, Insights Ryan Brown caught up with some senior athletes who are hoping they get to take the field one more time. It was an unexpectedly long off season, delaying the moment these Randolph-Macon college baseball players take the field for the last time. Baseball is really all I've known for my whole life. Brian Deere and Zach Radcliffe saw last year's seniors get stranded on third and now are doing everything they can to get one last chance. Yeah, we kind of knew it was going to happen. We played our last game against York uh, in this place and it was honestly a pretty cool game. A lot of seniors got to play. The game was a 14 to 1 win on March 12th. When the NCAA decided they were going to shut down all spring sports back in March of this year, people realized that seniors had immediately lost the chance to take the field one final time and get their senior night. Everyone that was here that day saw us sitting in the outfield uh, in tears after the game. Um, it was just a lot of uncertainty. We didn't know what was going to happen, so we were just hoping for the best at that point. And the next game? No one knows. Randolph Macon plays in the ODAC League, which has yet to provide any information on their upcoming season. But both players are doing all that they would during a normal offseason with a few modifications. Basically just trying to train ourselves and we can't we can't lift as a team. We can't really do anything as a team right now. In order to help make sure all spring athletes are able to get their season, Deer and Radcliffe say it comes down to everybody doing their part. Stay masked up, social distance. It's going to be very special. We're going to leave everything on the field we can um, if we do get that season. Reporting for VCU Insight, I'm Ryan Brown. That does it for this edition of VCU Insight. Check out our YouTube channel every Friday to see our weekly newscast. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter. Let us know about any stories you'd like to see us cover. I'm Dominga Murray. Thanks for watching.